Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Gab. So uh, thank you for having me. Yay, Postgres open. Woo! Awesome. So, so basically, Gab spoke about most of my first slide, which is pretty good, except one other thing is I was also the galley cook on Magnus's workship. Um, and I'd say I like to think I did a very good job. Magnus is not in the room, so he can't confirm nor deny that. But one quick thing before we jump into the talk about NYC Pug. So I'm very passionate about user groups and building an you know, organic grassroots Postgres community. And the user groups are really one of the primary ways to, to help. And of course, you know, one can argue you know, New York. We have 8 million people in the, in the city, you know, 25 million in the metro area. OK, you know, maybe these numbers you know, seem really good because we have a lot of people. Yes, but you know, we're competing against like, those hot new technologies like Hadoop and Node. And, you know, you know, it really takes a lot of work to get people to like think about boring relational databases, but just through like some you know passion, some work, and regularity, you know, you can really build up a user group. And I'm more than happy to talk about user groups with anyone, you know, all day, anytime. Um, we also have dates for the conference in New York City if you want to come by, March 25th through March 27th in 2015. We had uh, 250 plus attendees last year. We're expecting more this year. Okay, enough of the plug. So. You guys came to a talk called On Beyond Data Types, and I thought I'd give you the inspiration behind it. Well, the inspiration was I wanted to have a catchy enough title for you to come to the talk. And you know, while trying to submit the talk, I'm trying to think of, you know, we're talking about these advanced data types, where do they come from? I thought about this book by Dr. Seuss, On Beyond Zebra. So what's the premise of the book? Does anyone remember? No. <laughs> so the premise of the book is we get to the end of the alphabet. We're at Z. What, com what comes beyond it? And basically, Dr. Seuss creates this whole new alphabet. It explores, like, you know, through a normal Seussian magical adventure, what lies beyond. And you know, what's interesting is, you know, when you think about data types, I mean, what is a data type in a computer? You know, we have these fundamental bits. And then you know, that's really annoying to think about zeros and ones all day. So we step it up a little bit and have hexadecimal, which is kind of better, but you're just compressing it down into a form that's more readable. And you know, it's not necessarily accessible. You know, it's much easier for me to see a string like A, B, C, D than it is to see like a bunch of you know, fours and ones and A's all together. So we do a little bit better when we're with C, sort of. But with C, you know, we have these fundamental data types. We have characters. We have integers. We have Booleans in, I guess, C version 99, or a C expert can correct me where I'm wrong. And you, know, you have different type modifiers. And you know, these are sort of the basic building blocks. But you know, we always want to do something more complex. But before we get more complex, let's see how Postgres handles the basic building blocks, which, just like C, you know, we have characters, we have integers, we have real numbers, and we have Booleans. And I actually have a tutorial version of this talk. And believe it or not, the, these data types right here, like I, I'll spend nearly an hour just on them. And they're kind of boring. But they're also like the most important parts of the system because they're the ones you're most frequently using. In fact, you know, pretty much everything else is derived from them. So I think it's worth you know, summarizing you know, what's going on here. Is that you know, strings. In Postgres, when you're using strings, you almost always want to use text. Don't use car, because with the car, you're adding additional zero padding on no matter what it is. So if your car, let's say you have like a car eight, and it only, you only are using six of those uh, uh, bytes, there's going to be two zeros added on at the end. And it gets a little confusing when you're using uh, likes and similarity searches. You might get uh, incorrect results. Only use var car when you really have a limit. And maybe every single time you have a limit on what your, what your data is. But otherwise, just use text. Like text can store up to, I believe, a gigabyte of data you know, per, per field. Um, and just fun fact, under the covers of Postgres, they're all mapping to the same function anyway. So that's why everyone says just use text. Integers, you pretty much always want to use int. Don't use small int. There's, it actually, I believe, takes up the same amount of space as, um, as, a, as an integer when you actually uh, map it to the, to the pages on the disk. Use big int only if you have a big integer, because there is a performance penalty. Um, numerical types. So I always want to use numeric. Um, I deal with a lot of like, things where I need fixed precision, like money, because you don't want to get money incorrect, because your customers get really mad if your money is incorrect. Very, very mad. Um, so really use only like float, uh, float and double, I guess it's not double, um, 
really only use float if you're dealing with like sensor data or IEEE you know, 754 data that you know that you know, precision doesn't exactly matter. Otherwise, use numeric. There is, there is a little bit of a penalty on using numeric, but uh, I do have some benchmarks that show that depending on what you're doing, actually numeric can outperform float. Uh, it is fairly significant. I think I remember it being 25%, at least 25% overhead in my test. It might be more. I can't remember off the top of my head because I didn't prep that because there's other data types I want to get to. I apologize. Um, if we had more time, I actually, the date and time functionality in Postgres is like second to none. I love it. I, I try to use it even over like the programming language date time support because it's so good. Um, in summary, like they are awesome. Um, they're very flexible with the input. There's even like things you can tweak in the PostgreSQL.com file to deal with uh, the different dates and times. And intervals are amazing. I mean, you can like do intervals by days, weeks, years, seconds, like whatever unit. You can even create custom units. Um, but again, that's another thing that could take like 40 minutes of time. So we're going to skip that for now. So for you Futurama fans, what, what are we about to say right here? Erdman, I know you know this. Oh, let's take it up a notch. Then bam. So we're going to take it up a notch. One thing about Postgres, which I don't know if people forget or not, Postgres is an ORDBMS, an Object Relational Database Management System. And the idea behind ORDBMS is, is you're trying to manage more complex data types. Because you know a more complex data type can give you additional functionality. by for instance, you know, if you spend a little bit more time up front constructing your data structure, your algorithms might be able to perform more efficiently. You also have access to functions, you know, maybe one-line functions that you wouldn't have access to before. And of course, you know, Postgres, at, the, at its heart, cares about data integrity the most, that you know, if you're writing an integer to the disk, you're going to get an integer. If you're writing you know, a more complex date to the disk, you're getting that. And, and you know, as over time, Postgres has also become better at performance. But more, most importantly, if we are creating a more complex data type, we do care about performance. Because why are we going to waste time trying to represent something that's more complex and not get any added benefit out of it? You know, other than, you know, at the base case, you're representing something more accurately. So until I took computational geometry, I always thought that representing, starting with shapes is always the easiest thing. And then you actually do advanced computations on it and realize that was probably the hardest class I took in college. Why did I actually take that? I don't even use it. But it's actually amazing stuff. And I had an amazing professor for that. But for all intents and purposes, shapes are easy because we can visualize them at the end of the day. We don't need to do math necessarily, which again, I learned was a lie. But So Postgres supports geometric types right out of the box, and actually quite a few of them. You know, we have points. We have line segments, we have boxes, we have uh, open paths and closed paths, polygons and circles. So one th interesting thing to note, aside from you know, syntactically that you know, it might take a little bit of work, um, notice the size. So a point takes 16 bytes to take up. Well, that kind of makes sense, because if you look at a, what, what a, a floating point takes up in Postgres, it's 8 bytes. So you have two floating point numbers, each of 8 bytes, it's going to be 16 bytes. Now. The other interesting thing to note is that some of these, you know, for instance, polygons, you know, there's a variable amount of size that's going to take, take up on your disk, and it's going to depend on the size of the polygon, basically the number of points that you have in it. And there's also some overhead, too, just with instantiating the polygon, basically for it to store its information. So we'll keep that in mind, because you know, right now, let's just explore the functionality. But one thing to keep in mind is that you, know, there, you do need to think, to think about how much stuff is going to take up on the size of your disk. Now, if you have unlimited disk, I mean, that's, you know, storage size doesn't matter so much, but you have to consider this for performance. So operators. There's actually 31 different operators built into Postgres for geometry. And I actually, I may, I may have even miscounted. There's maybe even more. The first important one is equivalence. Basically, is this point equal to this point? Is this box equal to this box? Now, keep that in mind. I'm saying equal, but this is really equivalence, and we're going to get back to equals a little bit later. You, know, you can also do things like translation, that you know, if I take 0.11 and move it to 0.22, then it should be 0.33. You know, simple geometry. 
You can even find the distance between two points. So between 1, 1, and 4, 4, it's this big number I'm not going to read out loud. But useful. You know, oftentimes, you know, when dealing with geometric applications, you, know, you care about collision detection. Um, so we, we have overlapping functions, containment functions, intersection functions. There's also one to check if two line segments are parallel or if they're perpendicular to each other. Though for the sake of brevity, I only show the parallel example. And by the way, um, I am going to post these slides online after, which is why there's all these URLs at the bottom to try to create a handy reference guide. There's also a bunch of functions, too. Um, there's 13, as I said, 13 non-type conversion functions. There's actually a bunch of functions of the Postgres geometric types that convert between, I think, like boxes and circles, which that doesn't sound right. Maybe it's like a box and a polygon. Again, I can't remember off the top of my head. But you also have things that might be you know, more apropos, like area, finding the area of a circle, finding the center of a box, finding the length of a line segment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how well do these perform? Because again, we could represent these geometric shapes. We could be accurate with them. But if they're slow as hell, why are we going to use them? So we have to consider that you know, the amount of IO it's going to take up to you know, retrieve these objects. But of course, Postgres has indexing. You know, it should help. So let's try to build a B-tree index on this. So first, you know, I created a model. I called it houses. And I basically have like, the plot for a house. And I keep it as a box because, you know, I'm not, I'm not running a geographic survey. It's for the purposes of it, this exercise. So I just insert a bunch of random plots, you know, about a million of them. And I try to create an index. And I get this error. Data type box has no default operator class for access method B tree. Does anyone know why that is? Yes, Kevin? It's hard to decide what to order by. Exactly. We don't know what, what is equal to what necessarily in space. Because, and that's why we have the equivalence op operator, because two boxes could be equal in size, but maybe they're not in the same Cartesian plane. And also, when you get to ordering, another good point is, you know, let's say this box is here and this box is here. Well, which one comes first? Um, so there's a few ways around this. The first are expression indexes. How many people are familiar with these? OK. So an expression index is basically an index created on a function, an immutable function or an expression. Basically, it's something that when you, if you, the known, if you have a known value that you put in, you know exactly what value is going to come out of it every single time. And what's nice about an expression index is that it lets us you know, create an index on a function you might run repeatedly throughout your code. So for instance, if you're doing, let's say you always have to lowercase your email addresses in your database and run it against whatever email addresses in your database, you know, I guess they're all lowercase. I guess that's a roundabout way of saying case insensitive. Um, what you could do is you can create an uh, index expression on like lower email address, and you don't have to. You basically run the function once, and it'll look up against the index in pretty much the same amount of time as it would take uh, to on a regular B tree. So in this case, we're going to create a expression index on the area function. For, for plots, because most likely than not, if I'm looking up the size of a plot on a house, I'm going to have to compute its area. So without, without creating the index, you know, if I just find you know, all plots between 50,000 and 75,000, we're going to do a sequential scan, and it's going to be a little bit slower. But after creating this expression index, uh, we actually uh, we do an index scan. And we speed up by, I guess that's uh, 15 times in this case. I mean, of course, you have to benchmark it against your own system. But the idea is with just a simple, simple little bit of index magic, we suddenly have made our geometric data type much more useful. There's also something called a gist index in Postgres. How many, how many of you are familiar with gist? OK. So in summary, a gist index is a generalized spatial tree. I'm not going to get into exactly what all that means. But basically, for some of those more complex operators, or let's call them the funny looking operators, we can actually do an index on them. So by using instead, so here, I guess in this example, uh, we're basically saying, OK, what plots contain this box from these co coordinates? So I create a gist index. And that's basically, in, instead of just doing the create index function, I add using gist and the name of the field. And now when I run it, it basically it identifies, OK, the containment operator is included in uh, with, with uh, the gist index on uh, the, bo the box type. So 
you know, we can actually improve our, our runtime, in this case, by a factor of four. Last but not least, something that's not so well documented in the Postgres docs, but is probably one of the coolest features in Postgres, in my opinion, is KNN gist. Now, this is a very special case. So KNN is, stands for K-nearest neighbor. Uh, who's familiar with K-nearest neighbor queries? OK, this is going to be fun. So here's how K-nearest neighbor sort of works. Let's say I'm a query. Like, I'm a point. I'm in the middle of the room. I want to find the three closest people to me. So I think it would be you, you, and ooh, this is hard. I'll go with you. So here's what's cool. This is actually a solved problem in computational geometry. They use something called a Voronoi diagram to figure out who are the, the k closest people to me. And the idea is that you basically build this, this data structure, the Voronoi diagram, and in basically you know, almost like constant time, you can figure out who, no matter what query point you have, who your closest neighbors are. So um, Oleg Bartonov and Teodor Sigaev uh, took this theory into practice and basically added on a special supplement to the gist index saying that if you define a distance function and define this distance indexing method, you can actually figure out in pretty much constant time, you know, no, ma given a, no matter where your point is, what my k closest points are. Now here's how you access it. So first I created, just for argument's sake, I created a new table with a bunch of points. You know, I called them geocodes because I think that's, that's the most frequent application of this method. Um, and as you see at first, you know, a k nearest neighbor query in Postgres, you basically do a select from whatever your table is, and then you order by the distance between your query point, which uh, this is actually the location of the Hotel Chicago, and uh, you know, your, basically your database of points. And then, in this case, I did limit 10, because I want the 10 closest points to me. So as you can see, it's kind of slow without any indexing. It's almost 300 milliseconds you know, with the sequential scan on my computer. Now I create the gist index, run the same exact query, and it's 0.2 milliseconds. I mean, that's insane speed up. This is why I think it's one of the coolest features in Postgres, but you really can't find it in the documentation. Bruce, we should fix that. Um, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can access, well, if you're doing it just with, well, just with the text type, you can access that with B-tree gist, I think. I don't want to be quoted on that. But I know the PG trigram, uh, they also built this nearest neighbor functionality for that. And trigrams are useful for things like spell checkers or more like, more like okay, this word is misspelled. Make some suggestions what word you're looking for. I guess that is a spell checker. Last but not least, see, I tend to talk myself in circles sometimes while talking. You know, it helps the thinking process. Anyway, last but not least, if you really need hardcore stuff with shapes, there is PostGIS, which is re this really, really awesome, well-built extension in, of, in major active development uh, for Postgres. And it's an awesome project. But if you want more information, I suggest you find a wormhole, go back in time, and listen to uh, Regina, Regina and Leo's tutorial, because I'm sure it was great. I didn't get to see it. I kind of wish I did. It was good. See, I can imagine it's good. They essentially wrote the book on it. I'm sorry? <laughs> there you go. So how are we feeling with geometry? Good? Did I go too fast? I'm in New York. I tend to go fast. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry, but I don't want to lose you all. All right. Let's slow it down a little bit. UUIDs, another type you can store natively in Postgres. It's pretty much it, really. It is. I mean, but here's the thing. It's, you have UUIDs, your universal identifiers. They take up 16 bytes. Here are all the acceptable input formats for them, whether you want to like, be fancy and do the proper formatting or just want to uh, mush them all together. What is nice, though, is that with the UUID OSSP extension, you can actually generate UUID straight from Postgres. I think that's sort of the, the added benefit. I, really could, I could go through all the different versions of it. I think it's a little bit pedantic. You could look up the docs, I think. But the one thing I will note is that it does depend on an, an extra UUID library. It's not necessarily the built-in UUID library in your installation. I know I have a little bit of trouble installing uh, the UUID UUID OSSP on my Mac. Um, on my Ubuntu box, I can do it just fine. Um, caveat mTOR. I, know, I did know that on the hacker's mailing list, they've talked about replacing it. But I know there's also other projects they're working on, too. I guess bug Peter Eisentrout, if you really need it. Um, 
Next type, network address types. How many of you would classify yourselves as a network administrator? OK, so, little, so I see some hands. OK, and Robert, who just walked in. Um, so Postgres stores network address types. And again, it's pretty cool. You can store them in, you know, there's all these different input syntax for them. You can store MAC addresses. The one thing to note, the difference between INET and CIDR is CIDR is more restrictive. So with CIDR, if you, you have to put in your subnetwork exactly. So like this 192.168.1.1, that 32 is correct. I guess it's the correct uh, subnet mask. But because this is not, it would reject the input. I'm not a networking expert, so hopefully I explained that correctly. What I do know how to do is math. And I know I had to do a little bit of network math. But the nice thing is I don't have to think about it, because Postgres gives me all, all these functions to do it. You know, not only are there the, uh, the various comparison operators, which means we can index these using B-trees, which is nice. Um, there's other things. You know, does this network, you know, is this network contained within this network? Basically, is my IP address within a, some other subnet? Again, useful if you're doing, you know, if you're managing a network and you know you, you want to have a central location to manage all your various IP addresses. And so because of this, I think in theory, you can actually manage your routing tables with Postgres and possibly even more. Maybe manage manage uh, all your your uh, your network rules, thanks to um, the foreign data wrapper support that Postgres has that basically allows you to interact with other basically other let's call them files, but databases different formats, et cetera. And also, with the dynamic background workers, I think background workers were introduced in 9.3, and the dynamic ones are 9.4. Uh, I could be corrected if I'm wrong on that. But basically, you can start spinning up your own services. So imagine using Postgres to spin up your own you know, DHCP server or your own, uh, your own uh, uh, network adapter, and then managing all the IP addresses you know, straight from Postgres. I don't know, just a crazy idea. Maybe someone's going to make a fortune off this. Maybe, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe a little bit of both. All right, next on our tour, arrays. Well, when you think about it, you know, you look at a tuple in a database, you know, one row, it's sort of like an array, right? You know, it's an ordered list. You have a bunch of stuff in it. But can we have an array within a tuple? So I think we should take it up a notch. Yes, we can. That's pretty cool. We can store arrays as their own field in Postgres. A couple things to note, though. Arrays are one indexed, that, which means basically you know, if you try to do array, blah, 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 subset 0, it's going to be null. But if you do 1, you'll get the first value. Now, most programming languages I've used tend to be 0 indexed. So this is sort of a little like, OK, you got to think about this when uh, directly querying Postgres. Um, OK, but now you all know because you've read this slide. Jim. That's actually controllable. You can set whatever rule or bounds you want to the And how do you how do you do this? Uh, there's a way to do it with the declaration syntax uh, to do it with direct referencing. There's a couple of different ways to do it. My advice is don't. <laughs> All right. So OK. All right, so out of the box, arrays are one indexed. And Jim Nasby recommends that you leave them that way unless you have some extreme case. The other important thing to note is that size constraints on your arrays are not enforced. So here I created a table with an array of you know, three integers. And here I can clearly insert four, a four integer array into that table, and it returns with four integers. Um, I know there's a rationale behind it, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but be careful. If you think you're getting size constraints on your, on your arrays, think again. Here's the other cool thing. Arrays are very malleable. You know, I can edit them in many different ways. Um, for one thing, I can replace the entire array. I can, either, I can edit just one, uh, one position in the array very easily, or I can edit a range of positions in the array very easily. It's pretty nice. I wish some more of my programming languages could do that. Or, 
So the other thing is that you know, we have our standard comparison operators, which means we get B-tree indexes. But keep in mind that these are only going to work uh, over entire arrays. So I'm trying to see is one array less than another array, is one array, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We also have overlap operators, which this one re returned true because both of these contain three. We have containment, so uh, does this array contain this array and the other way around? And concatenation. And you know, basically, I can concatenate arrays together, or I can concatenate an individual element into an array. Um, again, I'll post these slides so these examples will be a little bit easier to read. You know, the idea is an overview of all the functions. So integer arrays use gin. How many of you are familiar with the gin index? Cool. Yeah, I know gin's been getting a lot of buzz in the Postgres community anyway. So the main idea behind the gin index is that you can basically look inside um, composite data types. And since an array is technically a composite data type, this means gin is very useful. Gin, I believe, is only, only works for integer arrays right now, but it works very well. Um, so for instance, here is, um, I have an array where, well, first I created a gin index. Then I decided, you know, let me search for, you know, in my arrays where any of them create, where any of them contain a 5432. So I use the equals any syntax, which is just to introduce that. Um, and basically I can say, you know, run the equals operation over and see if any elements in an array are equal to that. As you can see, that's kind of slow. So I got a little bit clever and I rewrote it. Well, I thought it was clever. I rewrote it so that, you know, an array, let me see if this array is within, you know, my data type and I can make, take advantage of the gin index then and get, you know, well, this ran in 0 0.09 milliseconds on my laptop, which is, you know, significantly faster than 150. And that's, I guess, you know, one of those things that this is really cool, but make sure you think about the problem the right way because you might get a much bigger uh, performance boost from Postgres than you might realize. The other thing to note about arrays as well, um, it's actually not covered in my slides, is a lot of people have actually been using them for data compression. And I believe you can take advantage of the toast compression on disk where you can basically roll up a bunch of your, you know, let's say one of your uh, relations into a tuple within one row, and you could actually get significant performance savings. I think, I know, uh, someone I know, I think they, they was like saving terabytes of space by using arrays as opposed to an additional relation. Well, it depends what you're querying over. Um, really, really, I think in this case it's more about I.O. Okay, so array functions. There's a bunch of them. There's actually more than a bunch of them. Um, I'm not going to go through every one on this page, but basically you can modify an array with functions and you can see how big they are. But here's some useful ones. Um, well, I guess they're all useful. Here's some ones that I tend to use more frequently. Therefore, because I tend to use them more frequently, they must be useful, right, by the, by the transitive property. So array to string. I can basically convert an array to a string, similar to like a join function in you know, other interpretive programming languages. And I can basically put in a, a little fail safe for nulls. And I can, you can also turn an array into a set, which basically means I can use an array and like potentially like treat, it, treat it as a table and then join it to something else. But this is the one I probably use most of all, array aggregate. So you ever get that, you know, someone in your marketing department request, hey, you know, I need a list of everyone's email address you know, from our contact database. But of course, you, know, you being the, the smart engineer, you created a, sorry, a normalized list of email addresses associated to everyone's contact info because they have a lot of different emails. Well, now you suddenly need that list and you need to know whose name it is, which means you, you know, you're suddenly like, oh my god, how do I write that query to get everything on one line in a CSV to give to them because I don't want to like, output something in an Excel format or deal with anything messy like that. So this is where array aggregate saves the day. So basically, you can aggregate all that information together in one line. So I have an array of every single name, or I guess in this example, every single name associated with a talk being given, or like every single name associated, every single email address associated with a name. I can then combine that with array to string and uh, do some, some little hackery on the, the Postgres command line and fully output that into a CSV. And you'll not need to do that much post-processing, if any at all. So, neat little tricks. So how do we feel about arrays in Postgres? Good? Pretty good? OK. Cool. So let's move on. Ranges. Ranges are fun. 
ranges are everywhere too. Like they're with scheduling. You know, you deal with them in mathematics, um, clinical trials. You know, if you deal with error bounds with something, and you know, financial applications, or for someone like me dealing with event event management software and trying to find out, you know, if I need a party from this date to this date, from this time to this time, with this budget to this budget, you know, you deal with a lot of ranges. Now, typically, range overlaps are kind of complicated because how does a range overlap? Well, there's four different ways you can overlap. You can either be too big for the range, be too little for the range, or overlap on either end. So originally, to optimize things, you know, I would focus on, where, OK, where does the range not overlap, in a way? Because like, if I know where it doesn't overlap, then I you know it's, the mathematics are a little bit simpler. Or you could also use the overlaps method in Postgres, which was available before Postgres 9.2. I, I forget when it was introduced. But the limitation is that it only works for dates and times. And it only works in one way, where you have your start, you basically have your, the start time, um, the variable you're searching for, and the end time. So it's a little bit limited. But Postgres 9.2 introduced this novel thing. The, uh, some work, the work was done by Jeff Davis, and basically having built in native range types within Postgres. And he basically gave us six to choose from two for integers, uh, one for numerics, two for times, and one for dates. So one thing, actually I don't think this is in the docs, uh, Bruce, one thing to add, um, is that how much, what size of range types take up on disk. Um, and basically it's going to be two times whatever data type you're using plus one. And the one, I believe, is a flag for something, which I can't remember. But sometimes it's a little bit magical. If it, if it detects that uh, your, your, your input values are exactly the same, it can compress them down to, to one. So it's only nine bytes versus 17 bytes for your normal date range. Quick review of uh, pre-calc. Ranges can be inclusive, exclusive, or both. So what does that mean? You need to remember your pre-calc syntax. So it's right here. Take a look. You can also have empty ranges. You can also have infinite ranges. Same syntax as you had in pre-calc as well. But beware, there's actually a special infinity value for dates and times. So because of that, so even though like these two infinite ranges are equivalent, these two are actually not equivalent. Um, but I think typically you probably would not be using the infinity keyword for your, for your ranges, but just be aware. Quick notes on constructing ranges. So notice here I did a 1 to 10 inclusive integer range but comes back as a 1 to 11 with the outer bound being exclusive. OK, be aware. The idea, though, behind that was that if you're looking at ranges in a row, you can basically concatenate a bunch of different ranges and not uh, worry about having uh, double overlaps. Short, short, bad explanation on it, but that's the explanation. That's only for discrete ranges, though, because for basically for um, infinite, uh, for non-discrete ranges or infinite ranges, um, that is the wrong word. Um, you basically have, you know, it, it'll match the syntax whatever you put in uh, by default. So if, basically if I want to say this was a completely inclusive range, it would show the, the brackets for both. Um, but by, by default, it's going to default to the lower bound is inclusive, the outer bound is exclusive. So the most common problem you're solving with ranges is finding overlapping ranges. And here is a database I created of like some cars and some fictional prices. And you know, it's very easy to find an overlap. It's that and and operator, which we saw earlier with arrays and with uh, geometric types. It's, ni it's nice when uh, operators are standard. And it works as you expect. Um, it finds, you know, if you see, here's my price range, 13,000 to 15,000. And it's found the thing. You have to believe the data set that that's actually what is overlapping. You can also use the gist index for ranges, um, which means that we can make really fast queries with our, over, with our overlap operators and some of the other operators too. What's interesting though is that if you're searching over a large range of something, let's say you know, here's a large range of integers. I'm searching over a range of 90,000 integers. It actually starts getting slower. And, it's kind of, and I've actually done some benchmarks on this. And basically, your, your query performance time increases linearly with the size of your range. It's kind of interesting. Um, I think I had a reasoning for it a while ago, but 
waking up early makes me forget these things. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. But um, it, was, it was my way of making it to Chicago today. But basically, just keep that in mind. Like, you know, but typically, when you're doing range queries, you'll probably be in smaller ranges. I mean, I find most of my ranges are within, like, let's say, a week of each other, or within you know, 1,000 of each other. And our perform we haven't had any performance issues. But there was something called SPGIST, which is called the Space Partition Generalized Search Tree. And it's basically a new kind of index that uses some of the same mechanisms as GIST. But the idea is for, like, it's basically trying to make use be useful for non-balanced data structures, so KD trees, quad trees, et cetera. And the idea behind this is that this is typically used for a lot for in-memory processing for a lot of different data types, but it wasn't really efficient on disk because of basically all the pointer traversals it had to do. So uh, Oleg Barchinov and Theodor Sigayev, and I believe Alexander Karatkov worked on it as well, they basically made it efficient to work on disk, which is nice. We actually we run as with using SPGIST indexes in production for some of our stuff, and they work great. And because a lot of our data is actually clustered together, and with uh, some benchmarks I did, um, I found that if you have a lot of data, like a lot of your range data, it's sort of like you know all within the same range, the SPGIST indexes work very well. They take up less space on the disk. They're a little bit faster than just GIST, and they eh, we we haven't seen them crash yet. So you know that's the the other thing that you have to watch out for. But when the data got more sparse with you know, ranges all over the place and not necessarily overlapping, SPGIST actually became much larger. And some of the, some of the query times are just like, ugh. Like, you know, it would take forever to run. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, one very useful thing for uh, dealing with range types is scheduling. Because you can use this thing called exclusion constraints in Postgres. And what an exclusion constraint allows you to do is basically say, don't put this data you know, in this field over some more complex uh, query. So you, know, you can't double book travel anymore. Or in theory, you can't double book travel anymore if people actually use this. So a dirty little secret. In my business, you know, we deal with you know, the scheduling of rooms uh, for, you know, for events, conferences, et cetera. Now, we actually, we actually do have an exclusion constraint on, on the table that, for the master scheduling, but we had to include an exception for it because, believe it or not, our clients like to double book things. It's so frustrating, but you know, sometimes you have, to, you, know, you have to kowtow to the customer and do what they want. But that said, you know, the nice thing about exclusion constraints is that you can create exceptions for them. So I believe it's you know, exclude using gist, blah, 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 uh, where, and then you create the exception where it doesn't enforce the exclusion constraint. Much like a lot of things in Postgres, ranges can be extended. Um, so in this case, it was about one line of code to create IP address ranges. I mean, you might be able to get the same effect using some of the built-in IP address uh, operators, but in case you want a range, you can do it. So now for something unrelated. Horrible pun. We're going to deal with some non-relational data in Postgres. So I realize we're getting a little short on time, so I might speed through some of these things. So HStore. Postgres has had HStore in it for a very long time. And what it is is a key value store. And basically, it gives you a one to basically a flat key value store to store everything in text, but do very fast queries. It's not that difficult to make HStore objects. In um, addition from using the syntax that you see them in, you can pass them in as arrays, as rows, and HStore can magically convert them for you. You can also access them you know, fairly easily. You have this uh, arrow operator that can pull the data out of it, you know, similar to like extracting uh, a pointer in C. Um, and you can do this in a variety of different ways, with arrays or with, um, yeah, with arrays. So you can also, you know, you also need to query over HStore objects too, and you can do that with a containment operator, basically saying, no, is, th is this key value pair within this HStore object? You can query to see if a key is in it. You can query to see if, you know, if either of these keys are in it. Sorry, if all of these keys are in it, or if either of these keys are in it. So the idea is that, you know. This key value store was created, one, to have a non-relational aspect to Postgres, but also it's got perform well, like all things, because we're all impatient and want all our results immediately. And the nice thing is that the gin index, that index that's designed to work on composite data types, works great for HStore. And so basically, just to compare, you know, a non-HStore query, you know, I'm trying to see if you know, the key three is in my HStore key pairs. 
Okay, it takes about 200 milliseconds. Slap a gin index on it. it. Takes a little bit of time to build, but when I run it, it basically takes you know 0 0.07 milliseconds on my computer. So you will you will get a performance benefit from using gin and age store. But now the thing that you probably heard a lot about that's been hyped up a lot lately is JSON and Postgres. So fun little history about JSON and Postgres is actually should have been in Postgres a long time ago. It started as a Google Summer of Code project in 2010. And the idea was that it was going to be similar to the XML data type in Postgres, which basically means it had some basic functionality, extract data from it, and you would be storing valid, valid uh, JSON. And it was, the plan was it was going to be committed as an extension to a Postgres 9.1, which I guess would be three or four years ago. So why wasn't it there then? Well, when it got time to finalize the implementation, there were different proposals over how to do it. Should it be a should it be a native binary type where all the data, basically all the data types are represented in their native formats, or should it just be a text type where everything is text and the whole world's great? There's also a debate whether it should be part of core Postgres or if it actually should be an extension. And this is actually at a time when the packaging system for extensions was changing a bit in Postgres, so it definitely sparked a lot of debate there. There's also a little bit of foreshadowing about what would happen. Um, basically, at the end of 2011, Robert Haas said that he basically saw two data types occurring, one for text, one for native binary. And Simon Riggs aptly named one of them JSON and the other JSONB. Little did we know. So in Postgres 9.2, we did get JSON. And basically, what we got was a data type that checks for valid validity. Much like everything in Postgres, it follows the various standards. Um, and it basically did exactly what it would do, which is, is this valid JSON? Is this not valid JSON? There were a couple of functions added too. You can convert an array to a JSON string, and you could convert a row to a JSON string. OK. It's a work in progress then. So we got to up our game in 9.3, where basically there were some more operators and functions added to read and prepare JSON. And you could actually cast between a JSON and HStore. So there's some operate here are the operators. They look similar, well, one of them looks similar to the, excuse me, HStore operator. But be careful. If you use just this operator, basically it returns it as a JSON object. So let's say I'm trying to do a string comparison, it's not going to work. So when you use the, the pointing sign with two, uh, two greater than signs, it actually returns it as text and allows you to do comparisons. Be careful. Operators can be confusing. So a long story short, I downloaded a bunch of Wikipedia data, I put it into a table, and I decided to test it against JSON. OK, we're good with that. So if I'm just you know, doing a regular string comparison, well, it's going to do a sequential scan, because I didn't put any indexes on it. So yeah, it's going to be slow over you know, a million rows. So I tried creating a B-tree index, and yeah, I can't do that, because we don't have any way to compare it. You know, we don't know what data is inside the JSON. You know, it's a composite data type. However, in JSON 9.3, oh, sorry, not JSON 9.3, in Postgres 9.3, they introduced uh, the JSON extract path and the extract path text functions, which are like these two operators, but you basically pass in a list of arguments. So you can be a little clever with uh, Postgres 9.3 and basically create an expression index using the JSON extract path function, and I guess you know, in this case, you know, over title, and you basically run it, and you can run the same exact query and get a gigantic speed up. I mean, we basically went from like 2.7 seconds to 0.1 millisecond. Now, the catch is when you're using this function, you can only use it with you know, basically one field you're getting out at a time. But you know, quite often, you're really only querying over one field or two fields within your, your JSON data structure anyway. So here's some numbers. Um, basically comparing uh, the relation, basically storing all that data as a relation versus JSON. So in the case of like some simple text queries, it basically, the long story short is in Postgres 9.3, it's better to just uh, keep it relational. This will change a little bit though. Um, JSON aggregate, this function is really cool. It's kind of like array aggregate, but with JSON. So you could probably do even more advanced post-processing with it. Um, you can also convert HStore objects to JSON in Postgres 9.3. The interesting one is HStore to JSON loose, which basically 
best guesses what your data type is within your textual JSON object and tries to convert it to its uh, native data type. But basically, it's still text. It's still a little bit hard to manipulate. And uh, don't get me wrong, it's very useful. I use Postgres 9.3 with the JSON stuff in production, and it's amazing. Um, but it's difficult to do the search within the JSON documents, and it's difficult to build new JSON objects. So once again, we got to take it up a notch. So Oleg and Theodore proposed something called nested HStore in PGCon in 2013. And the idea was that you basically create a hierarchical key value store within Postgres. And it could take advantage of the gin indexing that they had developed. And you know, it's, you know, it would be, it basically was very efficient based on the proposal and the experiments they made. The thing is though, like most people are most are familiar working with JSON because it's kind of the lingua franca on the web. I mean, as a web developer, I can say, you know, I, I use it everywhere to basically pass data back and forth between my services. Um, I mean, there's some other, there are some other things to consider as well, but the idea was that we could create a binary format as alluded to earlier with, for the JSON type and call it JSONB. Quick note, JSONB is not BSON. BSON is a superset of JSON it's, uh, created and administered by MongoDB. JSONB is the binary representation of JSON and Postgres, just, just in case people have heard otherwise. Or assume like, oh, JSONB is BSON, it's not. So important thing is that JSONB gives us more operators, and really operators to more thoroughly introspect the JSON documents. So you know, we have containment, we have you know, the existence, and we have Basically, the similar operators we saw with HStore, you know, ways to easily get in and access our data. We can also use the gin index. And it, the gin index supports you know, the containment operator in this direction. Uh, does a key exist? Do all these keys exist, or do any of these keys exist? There's also a pathops one, which is sort of like the light index, which basically supports only containment. And that's to build a little bit of a smaller index, which if you know you're only doing containment queries, it actually is a little bit faster than the full uh, a JSON B gin index. So now, I, so now instead of creating that whole you know, mess of an expression index to look at my data, um, I can use the containment operator to, to basically look inside. I don't need to restrict it to just you know, a title. I can use a category. I can combine things. So I can go really deep into the, the nested JSON document that way. It's also lightning quick. I mean, it took a, a total of 0 0.043 milliseconds to look up uh, the same query which actually I think might have been faster than the original query on the relation. Yep, it is. I mean, you know, one could argue this is marginal and there could be factors on the server that you know, affect it, but just uh, using the JSONB with the containment lookup is faster than uh, doing it with uh, just on the regular relation. I did have a, a WTF moment when I was originally preparing these slides was I was getting great I was getting great uh, performance when I was looking up the data with the containment operator in one direction, but in the other direction, it, was, it wasn't hitting the index at all. And you think to yourself, you know, the, you know, the containment seems to be you know, commutable. I should be able to swap this around. It should be the same thing, right? It, it is the same thing. But um, I don't know if this was an oversight or if this is a bug or if it's not meant to be, but uh, be careful. If you're using JSONB, use, the, use this containment operator where I have data, and I want to see that something is contained within it on this side. So that was a lot of material for like 48 minutes, I think. So I do want to allow like time for some questions. But a quick summary, um, Postgres has a lot of advanced data types. They're pretty easy to access. There are some funky operators, but I mean, you know, we can get over them. But because it's Postgres, it's durable. Your data is going to get written. It's going to be represented properly. And one thing that's completely out of scope of this topic is you can actually extend data types. You can create your own data types, and you can create your own data types fairly easily. And basically, you know, just in general with Postgres, you can make it do what you want it to do. And with that, are there any questions? Kevin. OK, I think I did it. So it's probably going to be in beta 3, because I don't think it was there in beta 2. I think you're right. OK, but that's good, because that, make, that makes a lot of sense. But, I would point out in my customer case would be that the existing gin index is only, is only effective for top level keys. Mm -hmm.
Yep. Yes. And so to mention something that John said, so JS query is basically a special query language for looking inside JSONB documents. Um, I guess it would be similar to TS query, which is the special query language to look inside full text documents, which actually we didn't even talk about at all. And technically, that's a complex data type, but that's a talk in itself. Fun fact, if you don't know it, Postgres does native full text search. It's really cool. Yeah. Any more questions? Bruce. Just to jump to what John said about managing stuff, it is special. And it's actually a big deal. And it's so cute to see that you can pair those two together in one pass. And you're doing it in that whole hash value combo. That's really what it's designed for. So that would be. Um, yeah, that one. The path ops, yeah. And also, th there's also some more work being done with the JSONB indexing, too. They, they've actually had to create a new index to deal with uh, much larger keys. Um, I, th I think it's still codenamed Vodka, as it's made from Russia. Um, but yeah, so that's coming soon. The other thing is uh, Jin has a lot of performance enhancements in it uh, coming out in Postgres 9.4, particularly around compression. But of course, everyone learned that in Magnus's talk today. Oh, more quite finally, more questions. Yes. So can you also invent your own operators? And is there yes. anything to keep you from overriding something that's already there? You probably cannot override an op like an equals operator for like an integer, but you can absolutely create your own operators. I believe the syntax is create operator, you get the operator name, and then you have to point it towards the functions that you that you basically uh, handle the operator. And you can actually write those functions in PLPG SQL. You don't you don't even need to get down to the C level. Yes. Have you run into any performance problems in the team, the index building? So, so I mean, I guess truth be told, when we built the index, the table was like this big. Um, so now the table is a lot bigger. Um, we, we haven't had any issues with it, at least any perceivable issues. Maybe we're having issues that I'm not noticing, but so far everything seems to be working well. Have you had issues? <laughs> Anyway, well, thank you.